today. You get home to your farm and there's these men in black that are waiting for you. And they say, we're taking half of your land. It's not yours anymore, it's ours. And then further they say, we're going to take all of your equipment, all of your bin storage, all of your livestock, and you can only use half of that as well. What would you do? What would you do if something like that happened? Well, you'd do something. You'd be pretty mad. And you would take action and you would do something. But folks, I'm here to tell you that there's not going to be men in black at your place to take half your land. But in a way, this has already happened to each one of us who farm. Because here in Nebraska, in the United States, across the world, we've lost approximately half of our topsoil already. Water erosion, wind erosion, and of the soil that we have left, we've lost more than 50% of the carbon, the organic matter, that's in our soil. And while our soil, we want it to look like this nice black soil like here, far too many of our soils look like this one over here, a light colored, low productive soil, because we've lost so much of the carbon. <laughs> and while people aren't gonna come and steal half your stuff, we've already lost a lot of the productivity that God has given us in these soils that we farm. And so what we're going to talk about here this morning is how do we get some of that back? How do we regenerate what has been lost? And so we're grateful that each one of you have come out to this conference to learn some of these techniques and principles to rebuild what has been lost. So just a bit of background. Uh, Tyler did a great job uh, uh, kind of giving our background there. But uh, my brother and I and our families have been farming there in the Bladen area uh, really all of our lives. I've been back on the farm now for 30-some years. Uh, we're about half dry land, half irrigated. This is what we want our fields to look like. We don't want to be able to see our soil unless we go looking for it. Because if we can't see it, it can't wash away. If we can't see it, it can't blow away. And so that's what we want our fields to look like. Now about 15 years ago, we started uh, down this path of soil health and we started a cover crop seed company called Green Cover. Uh, some of you have been there. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, in 2011. This was all a piece of farm ground. Uh, and all this has been built in response to how much uh, the soil health movement has grown and how much it started. Our mission statement at Green Cover is to help people regenerate, steward, and share God's creation for future generations. And, and we're, we're thankful to be able to do that. And one of the cool things that we get to do, it's an honor and a privilege to do a lot of different things, but we get to be part of some pretty big projects. And so a number of years ago, the Soil Health Institute came to us and said, hey, we want to make this documentary about soil health. It's going to be called The Living Soil. Uh, we're going to send out this professional film crew and make this, make this movie. It's like, yeah, come on out. And one of the things, they, and by the way, if you haven't seen this, you can view this for free. You can go to livingsoilfilm.com or you can just go to YouTube and search for it. But one of the things that they wanted is they wanted to show planting cover crops at the same time that we're harvesting corn. And, and we try to do that as much as possible. And so we said, yeah, go ahead and come on out. We'd, we'd love to be part of this project. So I'm just going to show you a little clip here. Uh, some of you may have seen this. But, uh, you know, they sent this film crew out, with a big drone, all this uh, fancy equipment. And so we hooked up the big four-wheel drive tractor to the air seeder. And I hopped in that thing and took off down the road thinking, man, this is going to be great. You know, this, this could make us famous. You're going to be in a film. You know, we're going to be movie stars. You get all these thoughts going through your head. And, you know, just about the time you think, man, things couldn't get too much better than this. <laughs> <laughs> things like that tend to happen. You know, God has a way of humbling us sometimes when we get a little too big for our bridges. And so... I show that to give us credibility as being real farmers, because that's the stuff that happens to real farmers. Now, I, and, and I'm pretty sure if you farm very long, that's happened to you too. Something like that. But I bet you don't have it captured on high definition drone footage. Like I it's pretty special. All right, so helping people regenerate, steward, and share God's creation for future generations. That's what we do. And so what I'm going to talk about here this morning is my talk on carbonomics because I want to help you, this is going to kind of lay the foundation for what Mitchell's going to talk about, what our producer panel is going to talk about, 
this is kind of the big picture theoretical, and I'm going to teach you about what's going on in the soil, and I'm going to do it in a way that's a little different because I'm going to compare it to the economy of a country. And you will understand things better because you understand economics. And I don't know if you remember all the way back to your high school or college econ class. Uh, we all have great memories of college, right? Uh, but, you know, here's some keys to a healthy economy. And these same principles are going to apply to keys to a healthy soil. And so we're going to go through each one of these and we're going to talk about how these economic principles apply to what's going on in the soil. And as we do that, I think you'll come away with a little bit better understanding of what's happening in the soil. So first of all, if we look at the soil as an economy, the first thing we have to understand is it's all based on solar energy. It's all based on sunlight. And really, we can say that we grow corn or we grow beans or wheat or cattle or whatever, but really what we're doing is we're taking sunlight and we're turning it into something about it. That's what we do as farmers. And then the three main players within this economy are the soil, that's obvious, the plants, and then it's the animals. And, and while livestock play a really big part in this, and we'll have a couple of our panelists that have a lot of livestock experience they'll talk about, I'm not going to talk a lot about livestock in this presentation. I'm going to talk a lot about the biological animals, the little ones, the things that you, if you don't have a microscope, you may not even be able to see them because they play such a huge critical role in making this whole thing work. So the first principle of economics that we're going to talk about is supply. You can't have an economy unless you have something that you make, something that you grow, something you manufacture, something that value that you can sell into the economy. That's the basis of having an economy. And so plants, they're producing carbon. So you all know photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the most important chemical formula in the world. It's CO2 from the atmosphere plus H2O, so carbon and water, and with the energy of the sun and the chlorophyll in a plant uh, tissue, it makes C6H1206, which is glucose, a very simple, basic carbohydrate sugar, and the byproduct of that is oxygen, which is a handy little thing for all of us who like to breathe. So this is really what plants do. They take CO2 out of the atmosphere and they turn it into something of value. That glucose molecule is very valuable because it is the basis of our entire food system. It's, it, it's the basis of everything else that happens. Now it doesn't stay as glucose for very long in the plant. It turns into lots of other things as we'll see, but within this economy, plants are producing carbon. That's the value that they bring. Now the soil, they bring other things of value. They're bringing nutrients. Now if you look at this chart here, you can see all these different nutrients. Ignore nitrogen right now. Nitrogen does not come from the soil. But these other things, potassium and phosphorus and calcium and magnesium and iron, our soils are made up of these minerals. That's the mineral portion of our soil. And we tend to have a lot of minerals in our soil. And the soil is bringing that as something of value to this economy. Now the soil also is providing a habitat for the roots. Your plants can't grow uh, without having some sort of medium. So it's a habitat for both the roots and the biology. It's a home for them. And then it also provides water storage, which is hugely important. And the more that our rainfall patterns shift and they become less frequent and more intense, and I get farmers pretty much all across the country where I talk, I see heads nodding going, yes, I, we've seen more intense and less frequent storms. It becomes more important that you can store it. Because if you get 20 inches of rain, but it comes in four or five inch rainfall events, if you can't grab a hold of that and store it, you didn't get anywhere near 20 inches of rain. So you can only get what you can capture and keep. So the soil has a big part to play in that. And then the biology, that's the third part of this economy. The biology is simply producing nutrients, it's cycling nutrients, it's making them available. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about how that happens and how that works. But they also deliver really important services like pro providing defense services and protecting uh, the plants. And we'll look at how that works as well. Now supply in a, an economy is great, but that does you no good if nobody wants it. Somebody has to buy it, and that's demand. And you hear people talk about supply and demand all the time. That's what drives an economy. And so on the demand side, if this economy is gonna work, the, the, the entities within this have to be wanting what somebody's selling. The plants need the nutrients and the water from the soil. 
And the plants also need to be protected and supported, and that's what the biology does in large part. So that's a nice little uh, combination of supply and demand there. The soil needs carbon. If you don't have carbon in your soil, it is not a productive system. It's a system that needs a lot of outside inputs. The carbon is what drives the whole system within the soil, but the soil also has to be protected. I showed you that picture early on of, of the corn coming up through all that residue. That's what we want our fields to look like because, again, we don't want to see our soil. We want to keep it covered. We want to keep it protected. And then the biology, they, they're living organisms like you and I, and they need food and they need habitat. If we can provide those things for them, they will provide all of these services for us, and they do it really pretty cheaply. And so that's one of the keys to making this work. That's a key to answering a lot of the questions that people had up there about profitability, how do we start the system, a lot of it hinges around the biology. And so what we see in, in a human economy is that one of the best indicators that the economy is really strong is that there's a low unemployment rate. That means everybody is involved in both the production of something and also the consumption of things. They're, they're producers and they're consumers, and that's a really strong, healthy economy. And it's the same way in our soil system. It's the strongest when everything is involved. But folks, what we've done in farming, and, and, and we're guilty of this as well, is that we have farmed in such a way that it has made the biology either go dormant or we've killed so much of it off that all of the services that they provide have gone away and we've had to replace that with something else and so within the context of an economy we have to provide a lot of welfare to our system so so many of our farming systems we're providing welfare and the welfare is when we provide that plant externally with the things that it could do itself like this, especially the fertility inputs and the crop production inputs when we crop protection when we have to do that then we're providing welfare to the system because the system used to be able to do that on its own and now we're having to provide a lot of that from the outside now I like what he has to say about this concept he says that you cannot help men permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. And I like this because when people need help, we need to help them. But if we continue to do those things for them that they could do themselves, they'll never get better. They'll never improve. They'll never get off the system. And it's the same way in our soils. If our plants are sick, we need to help them. If they're fertility deprived, we need to help them. We need to give them those inputs. We need to inject those uh, those external inputs to help that crop but if we don't change the way the system is working then we're locked into doing that year after year after year and and that's a treadmill that a lot of us have troubles getting off and I'm excited because the panel that's the uh, farmers local farmers that are going to be talking this afternoon they are getting themselves off that welfare treadmill and they're getting the system back to working the way that God designed it to work and that's by having the soil and the plants and the biology all working together to build this economy. And that's the area that we're weakest in, is building up that biology. Okay, supply, demand, and then currency. Currency is a hugely important thing within an economy. Because if you don't have currency, you find it difficult to make the transactions between the buyers and the sellers. If everything had to be bartering, trading a cow, or trading beads, or trading this or that, that really slows an economy down. But when you have currency, I can go to any store in town, I can buy whatever I want, and I give them a credit card, I give them cash, I can write a check, I can get it. It's a very fast, very speedy economy, and in our soil economy, we have the perfect currency, and that is carbon. Carbon is the currency that drives this whole system. It's the cash that makes it all work. Now, you probably all have told your kids, probably even heard this from your parents, this phrase, money doesn't grow on trees, okay? How many have said that or heard that? But you know what, in this system, it does grow on trees, and it grows on corn plants, and bean plants, and wheat plants, and alfalfa plants, because we can literally grow, through photosynthesis, we can grow the cash, the currency that drives the whole system forward. And unlike the government, when they fire up the printing presses and just print more cash, this makes our system better. And this makes our system stronger uh, instead of weaker. 
And so when we can take advantage of photosynthesis and we have more photosynthesis in the system, we get more carbon, more cash in the system to make it work. Here's how it works. So the plants are producing that carbon through photosynthesis, but as much as 50% of the carbon that a plant produces through photosynthesis, it's not used by the plant. It's not used to grow the plant tissue or roots or the seeds. As much as 50% of the carbon is leaked out through the root system and it's used to build up the populations of the biology. It's what the biology eats. It's how the plants are paying for the services that the biology will deliver back to them. And plants are really smart. In fact, they may be smarter than some people that I know because if they're making an investment and they don't see a return on that investment, guess what? They're going to stop doing it. And so if there's no biology in your soil to deliver services back to the plant, that plant will not put as much carbon into the soil because it said, I didn't get anything back from that. I'm not going to do that anymore. And so if the biology is not providing a service back to the plant, they don't eat, they don't get fed. And so that's the way the system works uh, is that you have to pay uh, if you're going to get the, the benefits and you have to deliver the benefits if you want to get paid. So carbon is not just a perfect currency, but it's essential to all life. You and I are 19% carbon by mass. Carbon can form over 10 million different compounds. It's the most overlooked, but the most important of all plant nutrients, and it's the main food source for soil biology. When you have more carbon in your soil, it helps normalize your soil pH. So whether it's high or low, it matters less when you have more carbon in your soil. It increases your cation exchange capacity. It helps make all of these important nutrients more available, and it can actually reduce the availability of things that can build up to toxic levels like sodium and aluminum. And think about it as a currency. Carbon can be collected through photosynthesis. It can be spent when it's traded to soil organisms. It can be saved through soil organic matter, which we'll talk about next. And it's desired by all members of the economy. And, and that's one of the keys to being a good currency. You know, Bitcoin will never become a legitimate currency until it's accepted almost everywhere. It may be someday, but it isn't right now. But a currency has to be accepted and desired by all members of the economy. And carbon has different states, just like our currency does. There's the gaseous form, CO2 floating around in the atmosphere. We have the liquid form that's moving up and down through the plants and the soil. And then solid carbon, which is what's fixed in living organisms. And it can go from one state to another to another. So you, a plant can take CO2 out of the atmosphere, turn it into liquid carbon, move it down through that plant, exude it out as a liquid carbon root exudate, it gets consumed by a microbe and turned into solid carbon in the body of that microbe, and that could all happen in a matter of minutes. And so it's a very, very flexible, uh, changeable product, and that makes it the perfect currency. And then when we have currency, when we have excess currency, we can turn it into capital. And that's the next principle of economics, a strong economy has to have capital because capital is needed for growth and stability and capital is just simply stored or saved currency. It's what you can build up when you have an excess of cash. And so in our soils, that is the soil organic matter. When we have excess carbon, more so than what the system needs, now we can start banking that. We can start turning that into long-term assets. We can save it. And that's, that's our soil organic matter. And that's probably one of the most important things to know about your soil is what's your organic matter levels. It's one of the easiest things to measure. It's one of the best indicators of how you're doing uh, on your soil health journey. And we can talk all day about the importance of soil organic matter, but we just simply don't have time for that. But we know that, that the soils are gonna perform better when they have that. But here's the thing, just like you can't increase your bank account, you can't make a long-term investment unless you are bringing in more money than what you spend. That's the only way you're gonna build your long-term capital or your long-term assets. It's the same way in your soil. You cannot build soil organic matter unless you're putting more carbon into the system than what you're exporting out of the system. And we bring carbon in through photosynthesis and we send carbon out every time you take a truckload of grain off your field, that's hauling a lot of carbon away. Now that's okay, that's the coal of farming, we have to do that, so that's okay. But every time you do tillage, that's a huge amount of carbon that you're losing to the atmosphere. 
And that's not okay because th that did not bring you any value. That did not help your profitability whatsoever. And so we have to look at where carbon is coming from and where carbon is leaving. And this is why cover crops are so important in a rotation because a cover crop is putting carbon into the soil. And I got some pictures of this here uh, later on. It's putting carbon into the soil without ever taking it away because we're not harvesting it. All of that carbon is left in the soil. And so that's really, really important. You know, in a corn bean rotation, most of us, you know, corn bean rotation, uh, you're lucky to grow your carbon at very, very low rates. And probably, you know, if you can break even, you're probably doing pretty good. Corn on corn, there's more carbon coming into the system, so you might increase your soil organic matter levels. But when you can add the cover crops into that, a cereal rye cover crop, other things like that, that's where people really start to see their organic matter levels jump up. Okay, energy. No economy can run without having some form of energy. You have to have energy to drive the system. Now, you know, our U.S. economy, you know, fossil fuels, alternative fuels, we have lots of energy sources that drive our system. And in our soil system, I said earlier, all of our energy comes from the sun. Uh, or the, the base energy comes from the sun. So photosynthesis, talked about this earlier, but the energy of the sun is the key to making it work. This is the way that we harvest our sunlight. Uh, and all we have to do is, is put out little solar collectors and uh, you know, plants, leaves, green leaves, are solar collectors that are much cheaper and much easier to install than man-made solar collectors, but we have to have it out there. And so the key to getting more carbon into the soil is to have plants growing longer. And when we're only doing a corn soybean rotation, we're probably wasting close to 40 to 50% of the sunlight that we get during the part of the year where we could actually grow a plant, uh, it, it's being wasted. And so when we have a cover crop out there and we're photosynthesizing during some of those periods of time, that's where we're really putting more energy into the system. Because just because the sun shines does not mean you're putting energy into your system. The sun has to be, that solar energy has to be collected it has to be captured and turned into something of value, something that will benefit your system. And that, that happens with a green plant. So if you have a perennial based system, well that's perfect. Because now you're capturing solar energy at all times of the year when, when conditions allow a plant to grow. But most of us don't have perennial systems anymore. You know, the, the prairies were built with perennials. So we have to try to mimic that. We have to plug those gaps with cover crops whenever we can. So a healthy soil economy shouldn't need significant purchased energy inputs. And I say that because these prairie soils, and we've got some of the best soils in the world here in Nebraska, they were built by thousands and thousands of years of perennials growing with no energy input other than the sun. Now when we start exporting a lot of carbon, because we're hauling away corn, we're hauling away beans, we're you know making hay, doing all these things, we do have to put energy back into the system. So I'm not here to say that we don't need any energy for the system. We wouldn't need it if we weren't harvesting anything, but that's, that's not realistic. But we're using a lot more energy than we would have to. And if you look at your energy budget for the farm, and you look at what is your biggest energy expense, most of us would say, well, maybe diesel fuel, propane, natural gas, electricity. <clears throat> it's none of those. Your biggest energy expense on your farm is nitrogen. And I'll show you why that is here in just a second. So when we move to resources, so we got energy, now we move over to the resources part because an economy, you have to have natural resources, you have to have those base materials in order to make your products, in order to uh, get the things of value that you can sell into the economy. So the number one resource is carbon. And that comes primarily from the atmosphere, from the CO2 in the atmosphere. We'll look at that in a little more detail here in a second. But the number two thing that your plants need is nitrogen. Nitrogen fertilizer, or not the, the nitrogen, is what plants need in the second most abundance. And as a industry, just in the United States, we spent $4.8 billion in 2021. You know, last year, 2023, I'm sure it was up over $5 billion that we spent on nitrogen. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But if you look at the atmosphere, 
And, and, and this is why I'm saying, you know, you would look at nitrogen as a fertilizer expense, but I'm here to tell you it's an energy expense because above every acre of crop ground that you farm, above every acre of crop ground in the world, there are 30,000 tons of nitrogen. 30,000 tons of nitrogen in the atmosphere free for the taking. But it's not in a form that we can use. So look at this chart. Uh, it's a little hard to see here, but carbon dioxide is about four one hundredths of one percent. So this is a pie chart of the atmosphere. And by the way, if you ever get into a conversation with somebody about global warming and they're making carbon out to be the big bad villain, ask them how much carbon is in the atmosphere. My guess is they probably won't know. But four one hundredths of one percent, not four percent, not four tenths of a percent, four one hundredths of one percent is how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. And yet we can pull this out, our plants can pull this very minute fraction of the atmosphere out and, and they can produce amazing things with that carbon. As they're doing that, they're pulling in 78% nitrogen. So when a plant is taking in the atmosphere, they're stripping out that CO2, that carbon molecule, they're also taking in 78% nitrogen, but they can do nothing with it. And the reason for that is that nitrogen in the atmosphere is held as dinitrogen. It's two nitrogen molecules. They're bonded together with three sets of very strong covalent bonds. And it takes an incredible amount of energy to break that apart in order for anything to use it. So otherwise, it's completely inert. I can breathe in this atmosphere, 78% nitrogen. If you've ever had a whiff of anhydrous or ammonia, you know what nitrogen can do to the human body. We've all known people that have either been killed or seriously injured from that type of an accident. But because it's held as dinitrogen, it's completely inert. But it's also completely inert to plants. And in order for a plant to use this, we have to break that bond, which takes a lot of energy to do. And so we can build these big factories like this and we can apply the, the energy to break that nitrogen bond and combine it with hydrogen and oxygen and put it in forms that plants now can use. But it's expensive. And so when you pay $200 a ton, $300 a ton for nitrogen, you're not paying for the nitrogen. There's 30,000 tons of that for free. You're paying for the energy that it takes to make the nitrogen available to your plant. But what it takes man $5 billion a year to do, God's given us these tiny little creatures, these tiny little bacteria, rhizobium bacteria, that do the same thing. They are separating that nitrogen bond between the dinitrogen. So they're splitting that bond and they're putting it uh, with hydrogen and oxygen and they're making it in a plant available form of nitrogen and then they're feeding it back to their host plant. You know, in this case, this is a soybean plant. They're feeding that nitrogen back to the host plant. And as great as this superpower is to be able to fix nitrogen, they can't eat that. That's not their food source. They can't survive on that their food source is carbon. And so this only happens if that plant is willing to pay the carbon resources that it makes through photosynthesis to this biology in order to get the nitrogen. And so it's a great system and it works really well for legumes. But there are other things. We have things like azosporillum and zotobacter and bacillus and cyanobacteria. These organisms are doing the same thing. They're breaking that nitrogen bond and they're putting nitrogen into plant available forms and they will sell this, they'll provide this, they'll trade this to any plant. It doesn't have to be a legume. Corn plant, wheat plant, grass plant. And this is what makes our natural native systems work without having a lot of legumes out there. And so you think, well, you know, that's great. Why don't we just go dump a whole bucket load of azosporillum on our corn and we'll grow 300 bushel corn with no nitrogen. Well, that's a great thought, but here's, here's the, the reality. Soybeans, the, the, the rhizobium bacteria here are incredibly powerful and they form these colonies. Each one of those colonies, there's billions of rhizobium bacteria working together in these colonies. And if you grow 70 bushel soybeans, that takes 350 to 400 pounds of nitrogen per acre to do that. Now, none of us would grow beans if we had to put 400 pounds of nitrogen out there. But rhizobia can produce 400 units of nitrogen in 60 days. Incredibly powerful, incredibly fast. These guys, they're single-celled organisms. 
There, there's not a billion of them working together, and they're single-celled organisms working within your soil, so they're not nearly as productive. These guys will produce 30, 40, 50 pounds of nitrogen per year, not in, not in 60 days. And so, is that enough to grow a big corn crop? No, but it could be part of the solution. Is it enough to grow a forage crop? Is it enough to grow a perennial crop, especially in a system that is recycling its nutrients because we're not hauling it all off. Yes, yes it is. And that's how our native soils were built with, with the, these natural factors happening. But in either one of these cases, this doesn't happen unless that plant's willing to feed that bacteria the carbon uh, in exchange for that nitrogen. So we've talked about carbon, we've talked about nitrogen. There's all these other minerals that our plants need. You know, potassium and phosphorus and iron and boron and calcium and magnesium, you know, the list goes on. You know the list. And I told you earlier that our soils are made up of these nutrients, and that's very true. Our soils are made up of these nutrients, and your soils have all the nutrients that your plants need to grow, but it's just not in a form that is available to the plant. So God never created plants to pull the nitrogen directly from the atmosphere. He did not create the plants to pull the minerals directly out of the soil. It all goes through the biology. And so we've got all of these minerals in our soils, but our plants can't get to them, so we have to employ all of these tiny little miners to extract those nutrients and get them to the plants. So I love this article from Scientific America. It says, Mycorrhiza fungi run the largest mining operation in the world. I love that title because you think of a mining operation, you think of this enormous equipment, you know, giant payloaders and, and whatnot, and they're saying the largest mining operation in the world is happening at a microscopic level, and if you don't have a microscope, you're not even going to see it. But it's the largest in the world because it's happening everywhere. It's happening everywhere in the soil. So this picture of this, uh, this is a little piece of feldspar. Just think of this as a like a little grain of sand, and you see these little brown channels cut through this highly magnified little soil particle. That's actually mine shafts. Those are hollowed out areas. So mycorrhiza fungi can secrete the right chemicals and enzymes. They can cultivate their own bacteria, and they can literally dissolve solid mineral, solid rock. They, they dissolve it, and they pull it out in a liquid form, and they deliver it back to their plant host as plant available minerals now, and they do this in exchange for carbon. Because as great as it is to dissolve solid rock, they can't eat that. Their food source has to be the carbon. And so that's what you see. Uh, this is a uh, highly magnified uh, mycorrhiza. Uh, this is called arbuscular mycorrhiza. You see these little black uh, arbuscles. They actually grow inside of a plant root. And then coming out of the plant root are these hyphae, and this hyphae go out into the soil system, and it's what's pulling these minerals in for the plant. We'll look at some other pictures of that later. Here's another picture. You can see the arbuscles in there uh, with the hyphae extending out. Uh, the author of this article, Jennifer Frazier, she says, oddly enough, many soils are rich in important nutrients, but they're often locked up in a physical form, which makes them unavailable to most plants. So if you want to reduce your costs for fertilizer, which we all do, right? We want to be more profitable. You have to buy less fertilizer if you have more biologically active soils because the biology is making those minerals available. Now you may be thinking, well, but if I mine all my minerals out, then I'll have nothing left in 10 years. But most of our soils, if, if you know, send your soil sample into a lab and ask for, for a total nutrient analysis, you'll be shocked at how much is in there. You've got enough minerals in your soils to grow crops for the next 10, 15,000 years. There's that much in there. All right, the next piece of the economy is infrastructure. Infrastructure is the equipment and the structures that we need in order for our economy to grow and expand and to function properly. And the two most important infrastructures are transportation and communication. And we know these are the most important because in times of war, this is what you go after first. This is what you would target first if you're at war with somebody. You would try to wipe out their roads, their bridges, their airports, and you would try to disrupt whatever levels of communication that they have. Cell phones, internet, 
telephones, you know, back in the day, telegraph lines, things like that. And so we know that these are incredibly important because that's what get attacked first. So as I was thinking about this in terms of the soil economy and how does this work, what's the infrastructure in the soil, I, was, I, I got to thinking about, you know, the U.S. economy is the strongest the world has ever seen. Part of that's because we have a great transportation infrastructure. And, and this came to my mind, I was in Brazil a number of years ago, uh, up in the uh, Mato Grosso region, where they have huge amounts of acreage that they can convert to, to farmland yet, but they don't have the transportation infrastructure there. To, to, it takes them three days to deliver their crop to a market by truck. And so our infrastructure is much better. So this is the interstate highway system in the United States. You know, big roads, very efficient. You can move large amounts of goods and services uh, across the country with this. But this only works if you can get to it. And we're down at Bladen, so we're about 50 miles up to I-80. We're about you know 80 miles to get down to I-70. Interstates only does us good if we can get to them. So what really makes it powerful is that we have a good highway system that connects us to the bigger highways and between the two of them we can deliver goods and services virtually anywhere in the country in a relatively short period of time and I know that some of you are going but you should see my county roads <laughs> okay I get that but if you have that attitude you don't travel enough you need to get out of the United States and see the roads in other countries and then you'll come home and you'll be thankful but the same thing applies within our soil. We have both systems in our soil. So a plant root, those big roots, the main roots of a plant, that's our interstate highway systems. It can move large amounts of goods and services up and down and throughout the soil. It can deliver carbon down from the plant. It can bring uh, moisture and nutrients up from the soil. And that's great, but it only can do what it touches. And, and if you look at the plant on the left here, this is not touching very much of the soil, so this can do a lot of uh, large amounts of transportation, but only to the areas that it touches. So that's not a, it's, it's very efficient at moving product, but it's not very efficient at distribution. So the plant on the right is highly colonized with the mycorrhiza fungi, and now that hyphal network has spread out throughout the soil, and now that network can bring in water, it can bring in minerals, it can bring in all of those nutrients that plant needs from a much larger area of the soil than just the plant by itself. And so again, mycorrhiza uh, transports phosphorus. Uh, it, it actually can mine that phosphorus. That's one of the hardest things in your soil to get to. That's why we're always putting phosphorus on our crops, even though you have a lot of phosphorus in your soil. It's just not available to the plants. But nitrogen, potassium, calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, boron, the list goes on and on and on. And in dry times, these things can help bring water in as well. So if you want to have a really drought-tolerant crop, don't worry about the genetics so much as worry about the biology that you have in the soil. And it's not just the mycorrhiza that transport things. Earthworms are a huge transportation infrastructure as well. When those earthworms burrow down, they're opening up channels that water can get in, oxygen can get in. Uh, as the earthworms are eating residues, they're, you know, those residues are full of all these other bacteria. The earthworm will eat that, they'll go to a different part of your soil, they'll poop it out over there. They disseminate and distribute biology throughout your soil system. And, and people a lot of times go, well, what is the best test I should do to test, to see if I have biology in my soil? And the first question I say is, do you have earthworms in your soil? And if they say, well, no, I don't really see many worms, then I say, well, don't waste your money testing for other biology because you probably don't have very much. Do things to fix your uh, earthworm problem first, and, and you know things like no-till and cover crops, and you know just for keeping cover on the ground. All those things, your earthworm populations will explode. Once you start seeing a lot of earthworm activity, now you can run a PLFA test or some other tests like that to test what kind of biology, biological activity you have in your soil, because it is important. So, so earthworms are a great indicator. They're one of the few pieces of the biology we can see. So take advantage of that. If you're not out there with a shovel or a spade digging up your soil uh, throughout the year, you don't know what's going on. And, and if it's dry and it's hot, you're not going to see earthworms up at the top, but you can see where they've been. You can see in this uh, clod of dirt you know, all the holes. And so we would know that we had earthworms there as well. 
Now the other infrastructure is communication, and, and I love this topic, and I would love to have another hour just to talk about this. The level of communication that plants are able to do is completely fascinating to me. I understand almost none of it, but I'm fascinated by all of it because it's incredible how plants, think about it, a plant can't move. It has to get everything it needs to survive without ever moving. And so in order to do that, they have to be master communicators to their environment, and they are. And so plants use different methods of communication. And if you think about it, I told you earlier that mycorrhiza can bring in things like boron. Well, a plant needs boron to grow, but it doesn't need very much. And if it gets too much, guess what? That'll kill the plant because it's very sensitive to those levels. And so if, if that mycorrhiza is just bringing in all of these nutrients willy-nilly, they would kill the plant because they would, they would overload it with something. And so the plant's very specific about telling the mycorrhiza and the other organisms, hey, I need this, I need this, I need this. And, and, and so there's a vast level of communication going on and it's not just dump the nutrient truck and let the plant sort it out. And, and the way that the plant does that is as it does these liquid root exudates, remember it started out as glucose, C6H12O6, it gets changed into thousands of other carbon compounds within that plant. And as it's leaking these different things out, carbohydrates and sugars and proteins and fats and lipids and oils, each one of those root exudates, those different exudates, is a signal to the biology for something different. And even the smartest scientists understand very, very little of how that works. But that's how we think it works, but it, it's difficult to measure, it's difficult to really understand exactly what means what. But here's a really cool picture that I want to show you. These are pictures from my friend Jimmy Emmons down in Oklahoma. Some of you uh, have heard Jimmy present before. So, so Jimmy took these pictures at his farm at a field day. So the picture on the left here, this is a cereal rye cover crop. Uh, he planted this uh, in the fall and he started, he had a field day out there, so they were digging with a spade and they were digging up cereal rye. This rye was probably, you know, eight, ten inches tall. So it was uh, not huge, not fully grown, but actively growing. And first of all, you can see all of the dirt clinging to that root system. That tells you that he's got a really healthy system because that bi biological glues are, are gluing all of the, the particles to the roots. But one of the places where he dug this up, he saw something really cool. And so the picture on the right here, uh, this is a picture of a cereal rye root, and you can see the soil around it. Uh, and so what he did is he dug it up and he broke it apart, and this broke right at a worm channel, a worm burrow. And so that's the dirt that you see around it is the outside of the worm channel. And this root is growing sideways through the worm ch channel. And so we're able to see a little peak inside there because now all these little root hairs are not growing in the soil, but they're growing in that airspace. And then he noticed something about those root hairs. And so he's got a, a little proscope, a little thing he puts right on his iPhone on the camera deal and it magnifies it. And so he was able to magnify it here to this picture on the right and look at all these little droplets. So this is just a magnified picture of this. It's just a blow-up picture of that. But all these little liquid carbon droplets, that is the root exudates that that plant is producing through photosynthesis and it's pumping it out into the soil and it's feeding all of that biology out there. He's got a lot of biology. We can see that from all of the dirt clinging, to the soil clinging to his roots. And this is what's feeding it. That's why he has a lot of biology, because his cover crop is pumping out trillions of little droplets of carbon through photosynthesis, and it's feeding that system. And so now he's, he's building up his mineral profile, he's building up his nutrient profile, he's building all of that up with a cover crop that he's not going to harvest, but it's setting himself up for the next crop, because he got, has that cover crop out there, and it's doing that. And the plant is communicating through these little droplets. Uh, and again, this is an area that I wish we knew more about. I wish we could get that. But the reason that this is such a unique picture is because if you were to pull your rye out of the soil, all those little root hairs fall off. 
And if you were to be really, really careful and you dig that up and you dip that in a bucket of water and you wash all the soil off really carefully, you can see those root hairs. But in the process of doing that, all of that carbon goes away because it gets diluted in the water. So it's incredibly hard to actually measure what these things are. And so that's an area of science that, that we hope to know more about. Okay, uh, there's other types of communication too. Plants can communicate uh, through the atmosphere, through the air. Uh, this is just a little example of an experiment. Uh, I think some Australians ran, and basically two plants. And they, they, they set up the experiment and they know that they're communicating through the root system. Now, the plant roots won't actually physically intersect with each other, okay? But the, the roots of multiple plants can be connected together through the mycorrhiza, because remember the mycorrhiza can live inside the plant root, and the same mycorrhiza can live inside of a corn plant root and a soybean plant root, same organism. And now you have connected those and you have a pathway for both communication as well as nutrient exchange. And uh, I hope that you pick up one of our soil health resource guides from our booth over here because there's a really good article by Christine Nichols that talks about how plants can exchange nutrients when they're connected with mycorrhizae. Really cool and really uh, fascinating how plants cooperate. But they also can communicate through the atmosphere. They release these volatile organic compounds and they can actually signal to other plants when they're under attack by something. And again, we just simply don't have time to go into this. It's a fascinating topic. There's a whole article in the Scientist magazine talking about this phenomenon of how plants can warn each other uh, that there's, there's predators or insects or diseases around and plants will start ramping up their defenses. So plants can communicate with each other. They can communicate with insects. Hey, I've got aphids, call in the ladybugs. Uh, come, come eat aphids, I've got them right here. They can communicate with the biology. They're master communicators. And they have to be, because they can't move. So they have to communicate with everybody around them. And the last part of the economy that we want to talk about here is defense and protection. Because anytime you have a strong economy, it's going to be under attack. There's always people that want to take without giving. There's always people that want to consume without producing. And so we have to protect our system from water, too much water, too little water, wind, heat, cold, compaction, weeds, insects, diseases. There's all manner of things that want to attack. And without getting into a huge amount of detail, the best way that we can do this, in addition, and, and, and again, you know, there are times we'll have to use some synthetic inputs to help, but the best way we can do this naturally is to employ these principles of soil health. You know, we need to have living roots in the system all the time. We need to minimize the amount of disturbance. We need to maximize how much cover we have on our soil. We need to maximize the amount of biodiversity. Uh, systems that aren't diverse are very susceptible to just about everything. Weeds, insects, diseases, those things will attack everything. Again, we've got a really good article in this resource guide from Dr. Thomas Dykstra. Uh, he's, he runs a lab in Florida. And he talks about BRICS levels and how important the BRICS level, and that's, that's a measurement of how much sugar is in your plant, which is an indication of how much is that plant photosynthesizing. And he says, when your BRICS levels hit 12 or 13, insects are not going to attack your plant. They just don't, because insects don't have the ability to digest complex molecules. And when your plant is healthy and has a high level of those complex uh, sugars, uh, they can't digest that. And they will figure that out pretty quickly and they will go to another field. And so we can defend and protect our system just simply by having good soil health, which leads to good plant health, which leads to good biological health. And it's a system that makes itself better because all of the pieces of the economy build upon each other. And conversely, when you don't have one of those pieces working, it's a system that makes itself worse because you're continually having to address issues uh, primarily because we don't have the biology out there doing their job, doing their work. So again, I would love to have more time to talk about that, but we're up against uh, the clock here. So those are the keys to a healthy soil. Supply, demand, currency, capital, energy, resources, infrastructure, defense and protection. There's a lot going on under our feet out there and it's incredible how God made the system to work 
with the biology involved. But when we pull that part out, then we have to step in and fix it. And so just to kind of summarize things, I got eight takeaway points for you here. Economies are intricately interconnected and interdependent. And if you mess with one part of it, you're going to mess with the whole system. And that's what we've done. We have removed the biology, not on purpose, but just by the way that we farm, we've largely removed a lot of the influence and the ability of the biology to do the work. And now uh, we have to provide the welfare. And so number two, the principle is, I don't know, I'm not here to tell you to, re to completely eliminate it. That's not our goal, but our goal is to reduce it. Because the more I can reduce those inputs, the more profitable I can be. So I want to reduce the amount of welfare that we're giving our economy. I want to get everybody working again, primarily getting the biology back involved. Number three, increase your cash flow of carbon currency. Okay, Plant a cover crop and then go tell your banker that you increased your cash flow. See what he says. Mention my name. But when we're only planting corn and beans, we're not taking advantage of all the sunlight that we have. We're not increasing our cash flow of that carbon currency. And so we have to put a cover crop in there. We can integrate livestock. We can do all manner of things. We can, we can uh, put a, a wheat crop out there and then plant a big cover crop after that. Lots of different things that we can do, but we have to capture more sunlight if you want more carbon in your soil. It's just simply that, that easy. You want more carbon, you have to have more plants growing. And in addition to that, it could lead then to other payments. Mitchell is going to talk about some opportunities. Some of the questions up here were about cost share uh, and different programs like that. A lot of these programs are going to be predicated on how much carbon can you put in the soil. Well, you can't put it in if you're not growing a plant. And so you need to increase that cash flow. And then as you get more cash flow, as you get more carbon into the system, now you can invest that. You can make capital investments. You can start to increase the levels of organic matter that you have out there. That is your long-term investment. And then when you do that, when you make those long-term investments, don't come in and do things like this. Unnecessary tillage, unnecessary residue removal, because that's literally like you're selling off those investments that you just made. And, and the thing about capital is when you make a long-term investment, you need to leave it alone. You can't be pulling out of that all of the time. So if you want the, your soil to grow, you can't be doing those sorts of things. Number five, take advantage of free tiny workers. They will manufacture, they'll mine, they'll transport, they'll communicate, and they will protect your system. The more biology, the better. I know that as farmers, sometimes we see a bug out there, and our tendency is just to go kill it, spray it. Jonathan Lundgren tells us for every pest type insect, there's 1,700 insects that are either good or they're neutral to your plants. But when you spray, you kill them all. Number six, build and, and do not destroy your infrastructure. You'll really see your economy grow. Try to think about how you can change your farming methods to get more mycorrhiza, to get more earthworms in your soil, because that's building those transportation and communication infrastructures. And then when you do that, don't come in and do this. Don't do these unnecessary tillage passes because this is literally declaring war on your soil. Because when you destroy the infrastructure of an economy, that's an act of war. We don't want to do that. Number seven, protect your economy of soil armor. Keep that soil covered. So important because you can do all of the things right, but if your soil is bare, it's going to be really, really hard to make any progress. And then number eight, diversity is so very important. For a healthy economy, you got to have diversity of plants, diversity of roots, and diversity of the biology. And the guys this afternoon will talk about the inclusion of livestock, which is another really important part, uh, and they'll be able to really talk about how they've done that. So that's carbonomics. That's how the soil is functioning as an economy. All of these principles are at play. It's an amazing system. As you look into it, the level of complexity is just really incredible. We try to highlight a lot of this. I mentioned our Soil Health Resource Guide a couple of times. We, we are our 10th edition, so if you want back copies, you can go to our website and download them, but make sure you grab a free copy uh, here while you're here today. And then just in closing, uh, I want to just feature also our Dan Gillespie Soil Health Fund, Randy Pryor. Many of you know Randy back there. Uh, he and I are both on the board of this. 
Many people in this room knew who Dan Gillespie was. Dan was an incredible advocate for soil health. Uh, he was an incredible advocate for conservation agriculture, worked for NRCS for many years. He passed away tragically uh, from ALS uh, a few years ago. We've established a soil health fund uh, and Randy and I and several others are on that. And we've, to date, we've given out $5,000 in grants uh, to uh, a lot of it to high school kids who are wanting to further their education. You can see uh, some of the different grants that we've made there. And we're just really getting started. Uh, so if you have a local FFA chapter back home, encourage them to apply for some money. We've got money to give away, don't we, Randy? And we'd love to get it to, to young people who are wanting to study in the area of soil health. Uh, our fund has grown from the $5,000 that Dan said before Dan died. He said, I want to donate $5,000 and give it to a farmer to help them with their soil health journey. Well, that started a whole waterfall of things. Other family members said, well, I want to kick some in. Well, I want to kick some in. Well, I want part of that too. Well, now it's grown to over $100,000. Uh, Kellogg's has come on as our first corporate sponsor. They've committed $7,500 which is really exciting. Uh, so we're asking a couple things of you. Number one, if you know people who could take advantage of this fund, uh, have them apply. They can, they can, uh, you can pick up a form right over here. Randy's got it at this back table. We would love to have more people apply. And then you can also give as well. The money that you give, we've got a, a challenge match going on right now. So every dollar that you give will get matched by another dollar. And we'd love to build this fund up as much as possible so that we can give away as much as possible to promote and encourage soil health education because Dan was an educator at heart and so these grants are going primarily to educational type activities. So I think I'll just close on that. I know I'm out of time. I will stay up here if you want to come up and ask questions. We're going to go to break. Thank you to all of our great sponsors who are making all this available. Uh, so we'll go to break. There's drinks back here. There's food back here. The restrooms are just down this hall and to the right. So thank you everyone for coming and let's go to break.